Praise God. Well, we have a young man here today. In mighty ways. Rob Malcolm is a missionary to the, the campus of Yale University. I can't wait for you to hear his story. When I heard his story, I said, our church family needs to hear your story. Uh, you're going to enjoy him because he's, he's got a Scottish accent, so he's very interesting to listen to. <laughs> Any other Scots here? Okay, maybe some Henrys or Franks or whatever. Okay. <laughs> Rob, come on up here, brother. And uh, yeah, the red mic there, come on up here. Let's welcome Rob as he comes and gives us a little glimpse into your ministry. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Well, good morning. It really is a privilege and an honor to be with you guys this morning. And yes, my accent isn't local. Um, If I'm feeling a bit mischievous when people say, hey, where are you from? I say Arkansas. (laughs) And you'd be surprised how many polite Christians don't question that. Really? Arkansas? And as I said, it really is a privilege to be with you this morning. And and my wife and my two young kids could be with me. All right, kids, you're dismissed, all right? Uh, Go up to Kids Church. If you're still in here, maybe you've already found your way. But thank you for being part of our service. God bless you. So yes, so my my wife and our two children aren't with me this morning. We have a three-year-old and an eight-month-old. The eight-month-old still likes to wake up in the middle of the night just to tell us she's there, uh, which is always great and encouraging. But I want to begin this morning by asking you a question. Whatever happened to Michael? You remember Michael? Let me describe Michael. Michael was the baby that was dedicated right here with his parents beaming proudly alongside him. He then became the mischievous young man in children's church. You know the one that always puts their hand up first to answer a question, but you never really want to take their answer because you just don't know what they're going to say. Come on, if you ever taught children's church, you know, you know that hand, you know, their hands up. You're like, anyone else? Anyone? But then he grew to become an exceptional young man in your youth group. Just a leader, an influencer of those around him. And then with great excitement, Michael headed off to college. And you never saw Michael again. Because Michael didn't come back to church. Because the statistic is, four out of five Christian high school students who attend a secular university will walk away from faith. Four out of five will no longer follow Jesus. Now we could all send our kids to our phenomenal Christian schools. And they are really, really good. But then where would the salt and light be on our secular campuses? And that's where I come in and my my wife. We are part of U.S. missions in the Assemblies of God. And we work with Chi Alpha. Chi Alpha comes from the Greek Chi Alpha as in Christ's ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5.20. Where we're called to be Christ's ambassadors. That's our motto. That's who we are. And we work on the secular universities of America to reach our college students. Both those who have faith, but also those who don't. And so I want to tell you this morning about the college I'm part of. We are pioneering a new ministry at Yale University in Connecticut. So let me describe Yale to you. Five of our former presidents, three of our current Supreme Court justices, all graduated from this school. Every year it produces hundreds of people that go on to influence you and me, and we're barely aware of it. Why do I say the influences? Because what happens in a college campus today, in five years' time, affects you and me. Because when they're in their college campus, what their peers and their professors say affects what a student values, what they believe, and how they view the world. So what's happening on our colleges today is going to affect you and me in the near future. So five former presidents, three current Supreme Court justices, all from this one school. Every year it produces hundreds of people that influence us. They become our doctors and our nurses. They become the teachers of our children. They become the people that decide what our children will be taught. And as a former high school teacher, I know that's a big issue. They become our businessmen and women, our entrepreneurs, our scientists. Is this a place where I can sort of freely confess? Can I? Is Is this a place of grace where I can confess something? I went online to Wikipedia to look up famous Yale alumni. All these Nobel laureates, these scientists, I knew none of them. I came to the uh, media personalities and I knew all of them. Every last one. That's a sad admission. So let's see if you, if you know any of these people. Meryl Streep. Who's heard of Meryl Streep, the actress? 
graduated from Yale. Anderson Cooper, CNN. Ever see, heard of Anderson Cooper? Yale graduate. Now I'm going to age some of us in the room. Henry Winkler. The Fawns. Come on. Yale graduate. All these people graduated from this school. It is a highly, highly influential school. Yet right now, less than 1% of the students at Yale love Jesus. In May of 2012, 3,000 students walked over the stage to graduate and about 30 have the same worldview as you and me. 30 out of 3,000. Yet they will go on and affect our lives. Jonathan Edwards, if you ever heard of Jonathan Edwards, the great uh, preacher and theologian, walked across Yale stage. He's not walking across there now. 1% love Jesus. These people are national world changers, but not a national change um, influencers, but they're also world changers. Because one in six students at Yale comes from another country around the world. One in six. And they're here. Can you imagine with me one of these students who's maybe from Vietnam or China becomes a believer here then goes back to their own country? They're the best missionary we could ever send. The best missionary we could ever send. Because they're going back to their own country and they have a diploma from Yale. They're not getting an ordinary job. They're going to be the top politician, the top businessman, the top woman. Because they graduated from Yale. These people are national and international world changers. But right now it is an unreached community. Less than 1% love Jesus. But not only that, it is in a forgotten city. New Haven in Connecticut has no church like yours. There is no Assemblies of God church. We're a quarter of a million people and we don't have a church like this. There's no Assembly of God. There's very little Pentecostal witness. But if I'm downtown in New Haven, almost 20 churches will have the rainbow banner out front, accepting and affirming of a range of sexual identities. And I will be outnumbered as a Pentecostal believer by those with Islamic faith. There is a multitude of voices in my city. An unreached community in a forgotten city. And it's into that that we've been called. This is our mission field. Our story, in 2004, my not yet wife came to Scotland to pioneer Pentecostal University ministry. She is a pioneer through and through. And she came as a world missionary. And you know how the story goes. She meets the handsome young executive pastor. Still don't understand why people laugh. I think that's, that's just a statement of fact. I don't... And in case you're wondering, it's me. And uh, <laughs> We got married, had our first child there. And then in a period of prayer and fasting in 2008, we said, God, where would you have us be? And we felt God say, come to the US. I'm like, really? And when we told our friends, they said, why do you want to move to the US? Everyone's Christian. Third most unreached country in the world. China and the United States. So in obedience in 2009, we moved here. I attended seminary and Sarah continued to meet students and reach students. And then again in 2010, we knew I'd be finishing seminary. So again, we went into a time of prayer and fasting and said, God, this is what's on our heart. We want to be in the northeast of the United States because it's the most irreligious part of our country. And we love that. Number two, we want to be where people just aren't doing ministry. And number three, we want to be in a college community because we feel that's how you've wired us. And God said, okay, you're going to Yale. Time out. Can we have a do-over, God? (laughs) And it was funny. As we told people, the reactions were interesting. We'd say, we feel God's calling us to Yale. And they'd say, Yale, they're really smart. Ah, and what you're saying is we are not. That's a great gift of encouragement you have. Go and bless someone else with it. (laughs) Or they would say things like the Northeast. That's a ministry graveyard. You ain't ever going to see success up there. Wow. You've also got a great gift of encouragement. You go and enjoy your friend over there. (laughs) Anyway, in the period of three months, we heard four preaches from the book of Jonah. How often do you hear Jonah? Not a lot. Four times in three months. And this was... I call it the worst one. Some may call it the best one. My wife had been away for a week. Um, I, I picked her up at the airport. And I had been at a week's long training on how to pioneer a new ministry. It was an hour journey home. I gave her every reason why I could not do this. No, it's not me. I, I'm not this, 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 and this. We're not doing it. No. Next morning we go to church. Guest preacher. First words. 
Do you ever feel God's calling you to something and you say, I just can't do it? <laughs> Seriously? Let's turn to the book of Jonah. You are kidding. And twice in his preach, he even said, some of you guys need to move to the Northeast. We were living in Southern Virginia. I came out floods of tears. That's it, we're moving. <laughs> so January 2011, we flew up to Boston, or Boston, for the last time to really see if this was God. They had just, they had, just had three feet of snowfall in 12 hours. We drove down to New Haven. All I could see was snow. I'm like, I can't move here. Sarah grew up in Nebraska. She's like, this is awesome. We prayer walked Gail's campus for four minutes. I said, find me a Starbucks. I am so cold. We find the one Starbucks in the corner of campus. I said, it is a sign from the Lord. So we're sitting in the Starbucks and we're processing it because nothing is naturally attractive. It's Yale. They're really smart. New Haven is the fourth most dangerous city in our country. It is the 18th most unreached metropolitan area in our country. It is in the most irreligious part of our country. None of these give me a warm fuzzy. <laughs> and we're talking, and I felt God say to me, this is your Nineveh. And I knew God said I had to share it with Sarah. So I said to Sarah, honey, I think God just said this is our Nineveh. And she started crying, and she said, from the moment we landed in Boston, I've only had one phrase in my head all day. This is your Nineveh. This is your Nineveh. So we knew in that moment God said this was it. And this is what we felt God say. I love these students. They just don't know their left hand from their right. They're looking for truth in all the wrong places. Go be truth. So to finish, what's our dream? Our dream is simply this, redemption stories. We just want to see students go from darkness to light. Remember Michael that I mentioned at the start, this imaginary young man? He's a real young man. We know him really well. He comes from a phenomenal Christian home. His parents have been in Christian ministry for over 25 years. Michael came to our college in Scotland and ran as far away from God as he could. He didn't want anything to do with faith. And for two years, he went to some incredibly dark places. And all we could do was love him for those two years. Didn't want anything to do with it. But after two years, he came back to Jesus. He recommitted his heart. He is now in full-time ministry in the work of the gospel. Because we chose to be salt and light in Scotland. And that's what we choose to be at Yale. Salt and light. As we left Scotland, Michael gave us a scripture. And we know it well, Isaiah 57. He said, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And he said, you guys, to me, for two years, were just beautiful feet. So as we walk on Yale's campus now as brand new missionaries in this field, we just want to be beautiful feet. Bringing good news that sees students go from darkness into light. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak this morning. We have, oops, no, that's my hotel key room. Here it is. We have good old-fashioned Bible bookmarks. Please take one before you leave. It tells you how you can join our movement to raise 12,000 people praying for 12,000 students. God bless you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, Rob. Bless you, man. Wow, what a great story. Thank you so much for sharing. And, uh, we're going to take uh, Rob and his family on for $50 a month support as a church. We'll add them to our list of missionaries that we support as well as uh, prepare an honorarium for him today for being with us. But man, I, I heard your story previous to this and I just wanted our church family to hear it because what a mission field and what an opportunity. And what came to mind was the passage where Jesus was teaching uh, about what the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is. Uh, and Jesus, whenever he taught on the kingdom, he wasn't teaching about, you know, this is the kingdom of heaven way out there and someday you'll be up there and, and it'll just be, you know, wonderful living up there in heaven. When Jesus uh, taught about the kingdom, it says he, he brought the kingdom of God, brought the kingdom of heaven to earth. And so when he said, I, I want you to tell, I want to tell you what the kingdom of God is like here on earth. I want to tell you what the kingdom of God culture, community, environment is like. And so he said, it's like yeast. And when I, when I think of your ministry, I see it as, as like yeast. That, that a woman takes, the scripture says, Jesus teaches, a woman takes, she mixes it in with a large batch of flour until it works all the way through the dough. 
That, Jesus said, is what the kingdom of God is like. Yeast is one of the most powerful influencing agents in the world. A little bit of yeast goes a long way. You can take a little bit of yeast and take a big lump of dough, and that little yeast is not intimidated by the big lump of dough. That little yeast says to the dough, I'm going to eat you for lunch. (laughs) Because yeast is not about holding back, giving up or giving in. Yeast is about taking over because yeast takes over and it changes the condition of whatever it permeates. That's the power of yeast. And, and Jesus is saying, that's what the kingdom of God is like. It should permeate everywhere. It should infect everything. It should change the condition. And so we, as kingdom citizens, you know, I think sometimes we get our priorities off in the church. We're looking to escape. We're looking for the Lord to take us out of here. We're preparing to leave when Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh. This isn't about escaping. This is about reshaping. This is about being yeast. So get your mind off going, you know, to the next place. Don't ever confuse your destiny with your assignment. Our destiny is heaven. But our assignment is to bring heaven to earth, to bring the heaven culture, to perpetuate it, to nurture the kingdom of God. See, when Jesus died and he rose and he ascended back in the heaven, remember it says Jesus brought the kingdom. He says, repent, the kingdom of God is here. It's, it's within reach. But when Jesus went back to heaven, guess what? He didn't take the kingdom of God back with him up to heaven. He placed it inside of it. What did he say? The kingdom of God is in you. It's in me. Now be like yeast and permeate everywhere. And that's why it's so neat to be you know, involved in, in uh, you know, whatever your vocation, profession, your skill set, your talent is, whatever career you choose, man, you can impact the, the uh, society in, in a way that your impact will be so great. Whatever your calling is, whatever God has called you and asked you to do, Jesus never prayed for our departure. You know what Jesus prayed? He said, prepare them and protect them so that they can do what I've called them to do. That's what John 17 says. Jesus in John 17 said this. Look what he says. He, 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 if you can put that up there. Maybe I got it right here. It's up? Okay. Look what he says. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Next verse. My prayer is not... Here's Jesus praying for us. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world. Go ahead, circle the wagons. It's so bad. You know, the economy, the world conflicts, uh, you know, the moral decadence in our day. Circle the wagons. Stock your basement full of just add water foods so that, you know, we're just going to hold on until he comes and rescues us. No, he says, I, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. You go on in the next couple of verses. He says, I've been sent and so I am sending you. We are to be yeast. Sometimes we get the wrong focus. We are Christ's ambassadors, as Rob said. We are, we are sent on an assignment. We are speaking the very words of God. An ambassador. We're not of this world, but we are in this world as yeast. And I think that what really excites me is the best is yet to come. Think of what Jesus said in John chapter 14. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me. Now get this. This is, this is a big statement. They will do what I've been doing. And the NLT says they will do the works that I am doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Just let that rattle around in your mind for a moment. What Do we really comprehend what Jesus has just called us to do? Do we grasp the opportunity? Do we really comprehend the the power of Almighty God, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us? That's why we're not, to, we're not to receive it as a lake. We are a river to and let it flow through us. I mean, the opportunities are endless. It's amazing what God wants us to do to, to be yeast in this world. 
Now, we casually say, oh yeah, you know, I got, I got the Holy Spirit in me, or, you know, I've been spirit baptized, but do we really grasp what that means? The magnitude of the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And for many of us, we don't really listen to Him. We don't know Him very well. And depending on what you've been taught, we've been taught not to expect too much of the Holy Spirit, or maybe to avoid Him altogether because, hey, you know, that's, that's too way far out there. That, God, Jesus deposited the kingdom of God in us by his Holy Spirit. And, you know, I, I just look at you, my brother, and you're like yeast in a big batch of dough. But I see a, a, I see a tenacity, and to hear some of the stories of how you started with just like six students, now there's a group of 60 believers at Yale University. God is doing a great thing through you, my brother, and I'm so proud of you. And so you encourage me, you inspire all of us. And so I ask you, what is it that God's asking you to do? We're to be yeast that permeates, we need to change the condition of where we're at. So I challenge you to take that word this morning and understand that God has an amazing thing for all of us to do. And I'm thrilled with it. What I want to do this morning, uh, for the last few moments, and and, and don't worry, don't panic, but I'm going to set something up for next week, because next week is going to be something cool, that that, that, uh, something that happens here that's really cool. All right? uh, We're going through the series on the book of Mark. We're at verse 8. It's taken us a while here, but I just stopped wherever the Holy Spirit wants me to stop. And there's a word in verse 8 where I just had to stop. And it's where, where John said, I baptize you with water. And then he goes on to say, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I stopped at that first phrase, I baptize you with water, because as, uh, as we've been reading and looking that, people have asked, well, okay, well, I have some questions about water baptism about baptism. So I wanted to stop right there, take a few moments and explain that. Uh, And then next week, right here, we've never done this before at Celebration, but we are going to have a water baptismal service in both services next Sunday morning. We got uh, our bathtub from home. We're bringing it. No, we're not. (laughs) Our jacuzzi. (laughs) No, we got a portable baptismal thing. And we're going to set up right here and we've already got a bunch of people that signed up for first service, and in a moment I'm going to pl- pass out. We're going to do the old-fashioned, hand out the clipboard, sign up for a kind of deal. And you're going to get a chance to sign up to be water baptized. But you might have some questions this morning, so I want to take just a moment. The baptism that is referred to in verse 8 was not Christian baptism. That was John's baptism. That was a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sin. Jesus hasn't died yet. He was just beginning his ministry. So that was, that was a certain kind of baptism, but we find out as we, as we look throughout Scripture, after Jesus did uh, die on the cross, raised from the dead, and then before he ascended into heaven, he, he gave us one more command. The very last words out of his mouth was this, I want you to go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there is a command that Jesus gave for us to be baptized. But when it comes to this whole issue of baptism, there's a lot of confusion. I mean, I've seen people who haven't been really interested in church, maybe a a young couple and, you know, they've kind of lived in life their own way. They're living together. They, you know, she gets pregnant and then they get married. And and then, uh, you know, as soon as they have the baby, uh, wow, they're knocking on the church door. We want to get our baby baptized. We want to get them christened. And, And I'm like, well, you know, you haven't really been following the Lord's commands up to this point. What's the big deal now? And they're like, well, we just want to make sure we get our baby in. <laughs> you know, we want to make sure our baby's good with God. And so we have all these beliefs, and it's so emotional when you talk about water baptism. And as church history has moved on, churches and denominations have loaded it up with so many other things. It's, it's become so ritualistic. I mean, there, in, in the New Testament, and I don't want you to feel like I'm being critical of the way you were raised or the way you were taught, but there, there, are, you know, there is not one instance of child-infant baptism, infant baptism in the Bible. Not one, not, a, not, not anywhere in here. And yet, 
the farther that the church got away from the New Testament era, in fact, you get into the second and third century, is when infant baptism was introduced by some of the church fathers, Cyprian and Origen and Constantine. And the reason why they did that was, for the, the main reason was this. They wanted to, you know, they knew that everybody is born into sin, so let's take care of the sin problem when they're babies, and then they'll be good for the rest of their life, which really gives a false sense of security. And a lot of people rely on that today. Many denominations still practice infant baptism, Catholics and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Methodists and uh, Anglican and, and so on and so forth. Um, and they do it based on covenant theology too. Let's baptize them first as a child and then they'll be in the church forever. It kind of pads the uh, roll numbers or whatever. But uh, you don't find that practice in the New Testament. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong, that it's sin, you know, but what I'm saying is, you know, if you were baptized in an infant, you don't, you don't remember it. It really wasn't for you necessarily. It was for your parents. It was for the church. And so I encourage you, those of you that you've been baptized before, maybe as an infant, I'm not negating that. I'm just saying, why don't you be baptized for you? You understand it. Now you understand what Jesus has commanded every believer to be water baptized. It's really not an option if you're going to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. It's something, the very last words of Jesus, I want you to be baptized. And so, as we go, there, there's all kinds of things that have, have kind of crept in. And, but really, the example that Jesus set is the one we should follow. Jesus was baptized in water. John said, hey, wait a minute, Jesus, I think I should be baptized you. But Jesus said, no, 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 this needs to fulfill all Scripture. I want you to baptize me. And so Jesus set the example and was baptized. And then later on, he gave the command that every believer should be baptized. And then as you even go on after Jesus, when the church is getting started, you got Peter and you got Paul and all the church you know, leaders. You know, Peter, after he preached on the day of Pentecost, remember the Holy Spirit fell and uh, man, thousands were saved. 3,000 people were added to the church. They were saved. And guess what? They baptized them all. 3,000. Think about that. Streaming 3,000 people to get uh, baptized. It's because that was the practice. It was something that when you became a believer, you got baptized. That was your identification that you were a follower of Jesus. Now, what we do in our day and age is we say, bow your heads, close your eyes, raise your hand if you want to give your heart to Jesus. And that's about your public display of <laughs> coming to Christ. Or maybe you walk forward to an altar. In the Bible, Peter never said, okay, bow your heads, close your eyes. You know, He said, you want to be a follower of Jesus? Come, come down to the water, we're going to baptize you. That was the public declaration. So it's something that was practiced in the New Testament. Even Paul, after he was converted, what did he do? He got baptized. Another church leader, Philip, he ran into an a Ethiopian and he led him to belief. And the first thing he did, they got baptized. Even in the New Testament, whole families were baptized. So the point I'm making here today is, you know, let me ask, answer just a couple quick questions. Who should be baptized? Everyone who believes. It's as simple as that. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're old enough to really understand it, that's when you should be baptized. Don't wait until you think you need to become a better Christian. You know, I've oh, I got to clean up my act. Now, if there's something in your life that you know is not right, it's against God's word, it's sin, you're convicted about it, take care of it. And the way to do that is repent. Remember we talked about that last week. You turn from sin and you turn towards faith in God. It's that motion, repenting, turning away. So if there's something in your life that, you know, I, don't know, man, I would never want to do that because I just feel like I'm so far from God. That's fixable right now by saying, God, forgive me my sin. I'm turning away from that and I'm taking a step towards faith in God. And so it, it's really for everybody who's a believer. Why do we do it? Simply because Jesus commanded it. And really what baptism is, let me just sum it up this way. Baptism, it, it's a symbol. It doesn't save you. There's nothing magical in the water that once you go under the water and you come back up, yay, I'm, a, you know, I'm totally new. I never struggle with sin again. No, it's a symbol. Just like this wedding ring, this wedding ring is not marriage. It's a symbol that I'm married. If you wear a military uniform, the military uniform is not the army. It's a symbol that I am in the army. 
Baptism is a symbol that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And what Paul said in Romans 6, 4 was he said, this is what water baptism is. Let me demonstrate it for you this way. It's dying, it's, it's your, your death, burial underneath the water, and then being raised to new life in Christ. That's what Romans 6, 4 says. Baptism is simply dying to yourself, burying that old man. Really, water baptism is a funeral. You're burying the old man. So it's death, burial, and being raised to new life. That's what water baptism is. It, 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 it's, it's, and, but that's not the extent of our Christian walk. Now, okay, now I'm in, now I'm good, and I don't have to... No, what did Paul say? He said, I die daily. I crucify my flesh daily. So it's not just a one and done thing. No, it's something that we continue to practice. But water baptism is that uh, public declaration. And so how do we water baptize here? As I said, there's all kinds of ways that church history and churches have done it. Denominations have loaded up with all kinds of things. How we practice it here is what they practice in the New Testament. It's called being baptized by immersion. I mean, when you're baptized, you're going under the water all the way. Now, if you're a brethren in Christ, you get dunked three times. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit. Okay, again, nothing wrong with that, you know. Whatever you know, but I'm just saying, we we practice immersion. Now, there's other things that you've heard, maybe pouring and sprinkling. Um, that's what they do with infants. I mean, uh, you know, I know some people teach their babies how to swim by just dunking them. <laughs> but uh, for for baptism's sake, often children are. They're sprinkled, they're poured on, and, or maybe if somebody is physically unable, they're handicapped or whatever, they're unable to be uh, immersed, then there's sprinkling and pouring. So again, it's not about saying, well, that, oh, that's of the devil or anything like that. It's just a different way of doing it. But my call is for our church to simply follow the New Testament example. And so depending on where your background is and what you've learned, I mean, we could probably talk for quite a while on your experiences of growing up in your church. And, but I just really feel like we need to be called back to what the New Testament does. And, uh, you know, so what we do normally in celebrations, we have one baptismal service a year. It's in the summertime because we go to somebody's backyard pool. And it's always a great event, and we'll probably continue to do that. But I thought, you know what? Uh, we can do that right here. So next Sunday, we are having a water baptismal service right here. And I've got a clipboard. We're going to pass it around, and you can sign up if you want. Let me answer a couple of these questions. What if you were baptized as an infant? Do I need to be baptized again? I don't say you have to be baptized again, but I'd say do it for you this time. Um, and then, you know, if you have been baptized, maybe as a child or as a teenager or even an adult, can I be baptized again? Well, by all means. If it's going to add meaning to your Christian walk, if you've kind of turned over a new leaf, you're, you're walking with the Lord in a new, uh, new way, and you'd like to be water baptized again, you can do it. It's no problem. It, it, it'd be great to have you do that. If it'll add meaning to your Christian life. So I really encourage you. And, and believe me, um, I don't get an extra dollar, you know, for every person that's baptized, okay? I don't send numbers to our headquarters and, wow, you baptized 25 people last Sunday. You get a plaque, Pastor Mike, in celebration, you're doing great. That's not about that at all. It's simply following the command of Christ and uh, taking that step of obedience. And we'd love to celebrate that with you together as a church family. So I encourage you. Now, some of you might be like, well, I'm not sure. And, and take some time to think about it this week and get back to the office if you'd like to do that for next Sunday. Um, maybe some of you are not sure if this is going to be like your home church yet. You're kind of just checking it out. Um, you know, there's, there's no pressure. Uh, maybe some of you have some denominational baggage that you're, you're bringing into the whole thing. Or maybe you're just not sure if you're good enough, if you're fully converted. Well, hopefully this morning you, you've... you've gained a little bit more understanding of what water baptism is. And so I just encourage you to uh, follow the Lord in this way. What I'm going to do is uh, we're just simply going to take one of these on each section. I think we're missing one. Oh, you got it? All right. Don, would you just hand that uh, one per section and just see that it goes all the way through, if you would. 
Uh, just put your name down there, your, if you'd be in the first service or second service, and then if you want, want to include your email, that'll help us to be able to get back to you this week and remind you. Um, there, take one of the little sheets of paper, it kind of gives you a little bit of instructions on what to wear and, and how this thing is going to go down. But I think it's going to be just a fantastic thing for next Sunday to do this together. Okay? So uh, just take a moment and consider that if you would. But I'm so encouraged today to uh, have our brother Rob Malcolm here with us. And we're so proud of you. And we can't wait to hear the more conversion redemption stories, as you put it. I'm going to invite Rob to come back up here. And I want us just to extend a hand. And let's pray a prayer blessing over our brother, his wife, Sarah. Is that what it is? And your two kids. How old are your kids? Three and eight months. Three and eight months. Wow. Wow, what a calling, and uh, we, we're proud of you, brother. Would you extend a hand, and let's pray for our brother. Father, oh, we just pray the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon Rob and his family, God. We know that you're going to give them divine protection, divine health, and uh, God, we're just praying for uh, divine impact, Lord. Father, as he uh, associates with people who are intellectual, God, you, you've pre- helped prepare him. You, you've, you've helped him to earn his doctorate. You, you've helped him to prepare in all those ways. But Father, I pray that as, as your apostle Paul prayed, he said, I have not come with human eloquence or superior wisdom. I've come with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that people's faith would not rest on men's wisdom but on a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So, Father, I pray a release of the Holy Spirit, of the supernatural, of signs and wonders to follow them that believe. And, Father, it will just astound them. They won't know what to do with it because that's who you are. We pray for many, many redemption stories, and we thank you, God. Bless him as he goes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Rob. God bless you, brother. Well, why don't we stand, and we're going to be dismissed today. Um, Take a moment, if you would, and sign the clipboard if you'd like to be a part of Water Baptism next Sunday. But again, invite family and friends to come, but this is an all-church thing. Don't say, well, next next week I'm not. We're going to do other things other than just the water baptism. It's going to be a great celebration together, for sure. I just want to remind you to sign up for the Friday night uh, volunteer banquet that we're having, um, and just some of the other things that we talked about earlier. Amen? Let's, let's pray today. Father, we thank you for the blessing of this church. Thank you, God, that we're not spiritual orphans, that we're part of a family. And God, we're part of your family. And we want to follow you and obey you. And so we take this step of water baptism as you lead us today. But Lord, more importantly, help us to be yeast that permeates the world that we live in. Help us not be intimidated but to walk in confidence and faith, not in fear, not in anxiety this week, but in faith in who you are and what you want to do through us. Greater works will we do. And so we begin to walk in that and step out in faith. We're going to pray for people this week to be healed. We're going to talk about our faith this week. We're going to invite others into our lives. We're going to get out of our shell. We're going to walk around with eyes wide open. Those people that are hurting all around us, even fellow students that have wanted to kill themselves this week. God, we're going to be so conscious and aware, not just wrapped up in our own world and not wrapped up in leaving this world. Thank you for the assignment that you've given us. Hallelujah. And there is a work to be done. And you have called us. You've equipped us. You've empowered us. Now, Lord, do it through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a powerful week. We'll see you next week, if not before.